The one brand that everybody seems to know in the States is Trek. And honestly, other than like some shady business practices like not paying your taxes and how they treat some of their dealers, this isn't a bad company per se. They do in fact make a decent bike, but what I would love to discuss with you all is their strategy of buying out their competition and then subsequently dissolving said company down the road. And I would just like to get your all opinion on it. So let's, let's, let's get a little cycling history in. If you guys have been enjoying these uh, more cycling history focused videos, let me know and uh, leave a like leave a comment, subscribe, all of that helps tremendously. First, very quick history on Trek just to set the stage. In 1974, Dick Burke and Bevel Hogg, yes, that is that is somebody's name in the US, established Trek Bicycle as a subsidiary of Roth Corporation, a Milwaukee-based appliance company. Like many brands in the 70s, Trek was making steel touring frames. By 79, Trek was incorporated and approaching two million in sales. They were also an early adopter of carbon frames and like Cannondale, even had a manufacturing plant in the US. So going into the 90s, Trek was relatively big. They were one of the biggest, if not the biggest, manufacturer of bicycles in the US. Number four. Next, let's talk about a company that in my opinion had some of the most beautiful bikes on the market at the time, Klein. Klein was owned by an MIT graduate going by the name of Gary Klein. You know, maybe, maybe Trek just had a thing for Gary's. And uh, Klein pioneered the use of large aluminum tubing. Interesting side note, when Cannondale came out with big aluminum tubing, Klein actually sued them for patent infringement, but that's an entirely different story. Klein did in fact actually use the aluminum big fat tubing before Cannondale, but Cannondale argued that it was uh, a piece of art because somebody else had done it before Klein, yada yada. It's, it was, it's a pretty interesting story. Klein was first purchased by Trek in 1995, just two years after their acquisition of Gary Fisher. And in 2006, Seven, the Klein brand stopped being distributed altogether by Trek in the US. This situation is a little different though as Klein was in deep financial troubles and if Trek wouldn't have purchased them, Klein would have simply just went under in 1995. But instead, again, we got their product for a few more years. Now there isn't a lot of easily accessible information on Gary Klein specifically about this time period, but if you chalk what I'm about to say up to just rumors and crap that I've read on forums, I've heard that Gary could be difficult to deal with on one side and on the other, he didn't like Trek that much. So take that for what you will. Number three. Next up, Bontrager. Bontrager is probably the most straightforward. Uh, Keith Bontrager was a motorcycle racer that became attracted to cycling, specifically mountain biking for obvious reasons. Him and his business partner, Hans Heim, started producing complete bikes, specifically being known for making some of the first lightweight but strong 26 inch mountain bike wheels. In 1995, Hans left the Bontrager to work for Santa Cruz and sold his shares to Trek. Trek then did away with the bicycle production but decided to keep the component manufacturing portion and they still use them to this day. Bontrager has essentially become Trek's OEM products that they put on everything. Bontrager stems, wheels, all that, all that jazz. Number two. I'm definitely going to do a separate video on some of these brands that I'm about to mention, but Gary Fisher is one of the most influential people in cycling history. He is a forefather of mountain biking and even coined the term mountain bike in 1979. Just think about that, before 79, there was no such thing as a mountain bike. <laughs> Fisher even started the first mountain bike company, he called it Mountain Bike, <laughs> and was having Tom Ritchie of all people to build bikes for him. But let's put that history aside for a moment, we are going to focus solely on the takeover. To be fair, the literal Gary Fisher brand was only started in 1983, and Gary Fisher himself said that after running the show for almost 10 years, he wanted to get out. I, I truly just believe that Gary really enjoys cycling and bicycles, and he was just burnt out on the corporate side of running a business that size. He didn't like the day-to-day -day 
that he had to deal with of being the president of the company. In 1991, Gary sold his business to Taiwan's Anlin Company, staying on as president, and then in 1993, the company was again sold to Trek. I couldn't find a ton of information on this limbo period, but it looks like Gary took a little hiatus, but ended up returning to the helm of the Gary Fisher brand in 1996. Now, it is important to note that Gary Fisher bikes were still a completely separate line of bikes from Trek. This is a similar situation to GT, uh, Schwinn, and Cannondale at the moment. Those bikes are all owned by the same parent company, but they are separate brands. A Gary Fisher dealer did not necessarily have to be a Trek dealer and vice versa. So Gary ran the Trek line for a whole 17 freaking years, and in 2010, Trek folded the Fisher brand into the Trek line of bikes and they called it the Gary Fisher Collection. This was simply business at the time, but the dealers that were Gary Fisher only had the option of either carrying Trek or parting ways. It is worth noting that I'm sure the buy-in and the terms were different between the two brands. And what I mean by that is at the time, Trek was still a much larger company than somebody like a Gary Fisher. I think Gary Fisher at the time had about 200 sole Gary Fisher dealers. Trek had tons. Gary always talks about how he thought it was such a great idea because now the Gary Fisher line of bikes is gonna have Trek's distribution marketing um, or distribution channel and their marketing power. But at the end of the day, it would be like, like Cannondale and GT are separate companies right now owned by the same people. Cannondale's not necessarily known for their downhill stuff or their BMX stuff. So let's just say all of a sudden Cannondale has a GT collection and it's the same company. And in 2016, 17, I believe Trek let go of the Gary Fisher line altogether and they parted ways. Number one. Let's not forget Le Monde. Le Monde has a special place in my heart because it was one of my first ever road bikes. So I'm going to give you the very basics of this story. And if you guys want, I can do a full video on it because it's, it, you could really get into the weeds here. Greg Le Monde is currently the only American to have won the Tour de France in the official records. Now, Lance Armstrong, that you probably all know, is probably the most famous American cyclist to date and was stripped of his titles and was Trek's poster boy. Now, uh, Lamon sold his beloved bike brand to Trek and stayed on much like Gary Fisher did in the beginning. Well, Greg started accusing Lance of doping and he was talking trash about Lance's doctor, Michael Ferrari, who is now known all over the world as the premier doping doctor of the time. So this is where I differentiate from the general public. Uh, most people that aren't in the thick of things look at what happened to Lance as an injustice because everyone was doping at the time, right? Well, yes, you would be correct, but the difference is that Lance could be a raging He would just say it a lot of the time or push people out of the way. I mean, he was, he was a bully. Um, that's not my personality. That's not how I would, would have done things, but that's his way of doing it, and, and it worked for him. I mean, he didn't have a lot of friends. I've known numerous people to meet Lance personally, and they all say the same thing about him, but I digress. If we just stick with the LeMond situation, it came out that Lance started threatening to ruin LeMond, that he will call Trek tomorrow and have the LeMond brand destroyed if he doesn't stop accusing him of doping. Well, in turn, Trek stopped advertising and stopped producing Le Mans as much. And when Greg realized what was happening to his beloved brand, he actually sued Trek, who he was actually working for at the time. Uh, he didn't have any hard evidence. It was Lance that was doing the pressuring, so Lance was simply named as a third-party influence in the lawsuit. But at the end of the day, Greg left Trek all PO'd and Lance kept chugging along. And Trek let the Le Mans bikes die off. And after letting the Le Mans bikes die off, Lance got caught doping and he ruined his entire legacy and in turn hurt Trek pre pretty good. Oh, karma can be cruel. For example, would, would that include that you've never um, used your own blood for doping purposes, for example? Absolutely, that, that would be banned. Okay. I'm not trying to agitate you. I'm just trying to make sure your testimony is clear. Okay. Okay. But at the end of the day, we still don't have a Le Mans line of bicycles. You know, quick catch up on Le Mans. They are producing like electric hybrids now, but it's still not the same. It's not the Le Mans that I knew back in like 2000. So those are the big brands that Trek has bought and subsequently done away with when we're talking about actual bicycles being produced. Yes, they are still using Bontrager components, but they don't 
produce the bicycles anymore. So suffice it to say, at least for a period of time, Trek's business plan was not to innovate and come up with their own unique products like Cannondale, but instead was to buy already established brands and ideas and roll them into their own line. Now this isn't necessarily a bad thing and at the end of the day, some of these lines would have completely died off if Trek wouldn't have purchased them. But for so many people now, Trek is deemed the one to kill off their favorite brand. It's, it's something that Trek's known for. Like I've heard people say, so and so just got bought by Trek. Dang, that sucks. I, I really like that brand and now they're gonna disappear. And is that really warranted or is Trek actually giving some of these brands a little longer life than they would have had otherwise? I'll let you guys discuss this, but I think the cycling industry is simply volatile and messy. And other than the Le Mans situation, I can't really see much that Trek did wrong. And you can't blame Trek too much because if you weren't around in the cycling world when Lance was dominating, that would be like a company dropping Michael Jordan. That would be unheard of. I, I, I as much as I want to dislike Trek for taking sides with Lance, I can 100% see why they didn't. You're not gonna drop somebody like Michael Jordan whenever he was winning. So what do you guys think? What do you guys think about Trek in general? Do you think they're overpriced? Uh, do you think this business model works better than Cannondale's? Obviously it did because Trek didn't go bankrupt, but do you guys have a little bit of hatred in your heart for Trek because they have destroyed, as I've heard people term it, some of their favorite brands, or is this just, uh, you know, misjudgment on the general public? Let me know in the comments below. I'm a little indifferent. There you go. It's another uh, cycling history video. Let's move on to the next one. See you later.